So you can understand, you know, so you, so you can understand, you can get a better idea of why this is by looking at the following plot where we, th this is a first principles calculation where we plotted the energy as a function of the polar mode along one Cartesian direction, relaxing every, all the other degrees of freedom. So we start out here at the tetragonal structure, we start to freeze in the polar mode, and you climb the parabola, as you expect for something that's stable. But then, at a critical value of the polar mode, you have a first order, there's a cusp and a crossing with another phase, a first order transition, this orthorhom polar orthorhombic phase has a minimum out here. So there's no instabilities over here to tell you that you're going to get to this distinct phase over here. And these two energies, as we compute them, are basically identical. So that's also quite character. That's very consistent with the anti-ferroelectric behavior of zirconia. Um, we'll, and I, I'm just, this is an energy surface for a uh, similar energy surface for hafnia in two dimensions with a uh, uh, with two different with a, with, uh, a two dimensional polarization. And uh, just we just look at this red line here, uh, you see that same cusp behavior, the tetragonal phase and the ortho and the orthorhombic phase. There's also actually out here uh, a local minimum, which is a, a distinct competing polar phase. In. We'll see more about this in Yugo's talk uh, later in this workshop. There's going to be a whole uh, session on hafnia, so that's going to be really interesting. But looking at this energy surface as a function of the polar mode, you know, I'm going to throw out the idea that this could be, you know, we should consider this a new class of ferroelectrics because we have here a polar mode, but instead of having, you know, this continuing this curve up to a high energy at the nonpolar state, it takes like a, a sharp turn and goes back down. So we're in, we, in, in these materials, we see things like wake up behavior, where after the materials first synthesize, you develop the hysteresis loop with the cycling. So you're starting out with part of the sample here, and then eventually driving it by cycling into the polar phase. Uh, it might also have some interesting switching behavior, because again, we don't have the barrier to uniform switching, but there's a, you can sort of tunnel into this phase. Uh, similarly, having this very low energy uh, for the nonpolar phase might affect what the domain walls look like, because a lot of times the domain walls are related to the nonpolar, you know, high symmetry version of the polar phase. All right, now I'm going to say, I'm going to argue that the super tetragon unit could come to a very similar, I'm going to go from there to the super tetragonal phase of perovskites. And this is, for those of you who haven't, haven't encountered those, these are metastable um, tetragonal phases with extremely high C over A and polarizations in the neighborhood of 100 microcoulombs per centimeter squared. And this is a, a kind of a characteristic picture. I would, this is really like a different structure type. You can get there by putting, making a really large polar mode, but it's really not a distorted, it's not quite a, even a distorted perovskite, it's a polar structure. And these super tetragonal phases you know, like, are pretty much everywhere. Uh, but in bismuth ferrite, you get you see a super tetragonal phase with very high compressive strain. Uh, we found one in lead, in lead titanate using negative pressure, uh, and we're gonna hear uh, a very, you know, I hope, I hope we're going to hear about this in Jim's, uh, in Jim's talk. They have a really nice uh, paper in science uh, showing how to realize the super tetragonal phase of lead titanate uh, under ambient conditions. Uh, and then there are other examples, like uh, from Andrew Rapp's group, uh, bismuth uh, zinc, zinc titanate. Uh, we have our own favorite, which is barium tin oxide. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the interesting thing here is like barium tin oxide structurally is one of the most boring things that you can possibly imagine. Uh, it's got no unstable modes at all. It's, it's really cubic. It's large. It's only interesting because uh, it has this very high mobility conduction band, which you can 
use for, for doping. Uh, but it's also got a super tetragonal phase. So with compressive strain, we plot the energy, find this some, admittedly somewhat shallow minimum, big jump in C over A, and you can plot the, uh, the energy as a function of C over A and see the two minima switching. Um, so I'm just going to, Philippe is giving me the time, so I'm just going to mention this is that the, uh, there's a, yet a third way to search for polar phases, uh, to, uh, which is to use the Komsky principle and combine uh, two inversion symmetry, two inversion preserving orderings of high symmetry reference phase uh, to get a polar phase. And those are not, don't, they can be, but they don't have to be lattice distortions. So for example, if you combine super lattice ordering and layered charge ordering, you can get a polar phase uh, which is switchable, and we call that charge order driven ferroelectricity. I've given lots of talks about this, about the Vanadate super lattices, and Sayong and I also have recently put out a paper uh, where we have charge order uh, ferroelectricity in, the, in, in 111 layered lanthanum strontium iron 09. And there's a big jump in the polarization, uh, and the band gap does not go to zero, although it's very small. OK, so here's my last slide. Here's my last idea slide. Now that we have ways of generating all these polar phases, we could have imagined systems where we have two distinct polar phases competing, and we can switch, get functional properties by switching back and forth between them using electric fields, either changing the magnitude or changing the direction. And we don't, I don't, we don't have any known so far, we need a search, but if you look at the, uh, the bismuth ferrite phase diagram from Jorge and Max, which I'm sure you recognize, Jorge, right? Uh, you see, you have like two polar phase minima, you know, like could be switchable, maybe with some, some assistance. Okay, so this is my last, so I'm, I'm done. Uh, just the message is, you know, I, I just still believe, I hope I conveyed the idea that first principles uh, really helps us explore the energy landscape. And I looked at competing polar phases, but we have even more competing phases for other, in, in other, for other phenomena. New high symmetry parent structures, I think we're now starting to see this in 2D systems as well, show this talk. Um, and you know, the, in, the focus was on the polar phases for which there's no trace in the phonon dispersion. And so, in the last 30 years, a lot learned, still a lot to do. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Karen, for the nice uh, review. We have time for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask about Hafnia? Uh, you say uh, there is no, no ferroelectric minimum in the dispersion, so should there be a soft mode, or shouldn't it be? Um, so, okay, so at the, let me just go back here. So here, so at the minimum, right, this is a stable structure, right? If you, presumably if you, uh, you know, it, there's, there's, this, there's a polar mode here that's, that's, uh, that, that, of, of some polar mode of some kind, but there's no unstable polar mode in if, you, if you're starting from the parent structure, right? There's no unstable polar mode in the cubic phase. There's no unstable polar mode in the tetragonal phase. So, you know, this is, these, this, this, the, the way you get a polar mode here is combining with a whole, with a bunch of set of other non-polar modes. And I don't know how to, you know, I haven't seen, I don't have, I haven't quite, I don't know how to kind of set that up to, to cast that in terms of a pole, an unstable polar mode. But if you have ideas about that, I'd love to hear them. So. No question? Go ahead. Uh, I will have, I will have me also. Um, do you know whether the cubic phase is a useful reference to understand the domains that appear in the samples? Because, uh, um, I mean, if you take the cubic phase as reference, you would have some expectation as to how many domains of the pharomic phase you should expect you should see, right? And, uh, and to me, this is a pertinent question. Uh, let me give an example of lithium nitrate. Lithium nitrate, I would say, is not a perovskite because the cubic phase is not a good reference okay. to understand the domain mm -hmm. pattern, right? 
is the rhombo hydral phase is a good reference to understand the domain in this scenario. And with Hafnia, do you know if this cubic phase allows us to understand the domain? Oh, I don't really, I really don't know for sure. I mean, I could, I, I know what the structure is. I know, um, I, in particular, have like we have like a mode mm -hmm. description in terms of modes of the, of the cubic phase. So we could we can do this counting, uh, but I don't know the experiment of how many domains there are. Or, and offhand, I don't can't do the counting in my head either. No, but maybe it was known. So I, right. Yeah. yeah.